Thank you, Hardy. <laughs> Welcome back to the Vale. I had uh, no idea that you've lived in Robin Vale before. I have lived in Robin Vale, around about Robin Vale, around about 1990. Uh, my oldest brother was a policeman in the area and uh, he was following in the footsteps of our dad, who'd been a 50 year career cop. Uh, first of all, in Palestine, he was born and bred in England, ended up being a Palestine policeman, then came back to be a Bobby on the beat at Bow Street. And they called him a Bow Street runner. And then um, saw an ad in the Cop Gazette in England saying, do you want to go to one of the colonies like South Africa or Australia? And he was what like, year is that? I don't know, maybe, well, don't know. Maybe, but, but, don't know, actually. But uh, maybe 1954 or something. Being described as one of the colonies. It does sound quite colonial. Well, yeah. And mm. so he, exactly. So anyway, he came out here. Uh, he was 30 years old and single and then was stationed in Bendigo in country Victoria and then I met mum and then they came to the Burbs. And so we've been a Glen Waverley family ever since. But my oldest brother, Mark, was a cop and went uh, to, ended up stationed in Robinvale after doing a series of uh, inner suburban Melbourne stations. And, um, and he'd met his wife in Kahuna. Anyway, right. then uh, I was going off the rails. I'd got locked up overnight a couple of times, you know, when I was 19 or 20 for drunk and disorderly, something like that. Just a brief period of, poor behavior mm-hmm. couldn't handle my, couldn't handle my booze and um my dad said to my brother can you get him up in the bush for the summer fruit picking just to keep him away from his idiot mates or from the pubs and clubs straighten him up and it worked and uh yeah i was a resident and picking the fruit and i remember the scare guns oh, yes. mm. and i'd walk on the sort of dirt path from where my brother lived to whichever uh you know orchard or what do you call them was employing yeah, me well- at the time well, what were you picking? Were you doing grapes or what were you picking? Grapes, yeah. You were picking grapes. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was a soft suburban guy and they were ripping my, hands, <laughs> ripping my hands to shreds and all of my colleagues were mainly Tongans who either were naturally tougher or had toughened up through months of fruit picking before me. Mm. So I had, you know, Band-Aids all over me like a wuss, <laughs> like a city boy wuss. You couldn't have cut the Tongan blokes with a bloody knife. Their skin was tough. Yeah, and this is this is probably why we can't get um we can't get the city kids to come and do the hard work now. Right. Well, I mean, I stuck at you, but we won't get. I, I stuck at it, but I don't know whether how much uh, productiveness I I did for the employer. Well, but, but I never got in anywhere near as much as the same trouble as I had been heading towards before I went up there. So my dad's plan worked. You didn't um get a flogging at the Robin Vale pub one night, did you? <laughs> no, I never did. That's what I say. I went up there to get away from that rubbish. Yeah, right. And also or- everyone, all the country boys, they've got better cardio than I have. Uh, they're bigger, stronger, mm. meaner. So I minded my own business. Yeah, fair enough. Well, one night at the Robin Vale pub, which is no longer, it's been burnt down. If you want to invest in a pub, it's right. um, it needs rebuilding. Could be a pub slash comedy club, Matthew. Right, yeah, I've heard right. that the, the comics want to travel that far for that short of time. <laughs> no, Dave O'Neill was, um, Dave O'Neill, I think, was the last one to come. He went further north. He went up to Kumiella past Mildura, and we spoke to him last. But um, it was interesting to note that you that you knew all about Robin Vale, which was very odd. But speaking of comedy, the reason I'm, I've got you here today is your podcast, and this is a loose kind of connection, so the Robin Vale one makes it local. Yeah. But your podcast and book at the moment, Saturday Afternoon Fever, is my latest favourite podcast. Great. Thank you. I'm happy you're listening. It's really, really very funny. And I would never have thought that listening to two grown men read a book would have been as entertaining <laughs> as, as it is, but it is. It's about you growing up and your affection for football. Give us well, the yeah. synopsis. So, um I was at school one day in grade three or four or something and a bunch of kids, boys started talking about wanting to join this local footy team, like a proper footy team. And uh, I live in Glen Waverley and um, a nearby suburb is Notting Hill. So we played for the Notting Hill under 13s or something. And uh, half of us were hopeless and half of us were all right. I was in the hopeless half. (laughs) And uh, around about that same time, I bought my first ever packet of footy cards, I think like 1979. And uh, the first face that I saw was St Kilda's Trevor Barker. Long blonde hair, pretty boy. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the colours of the red, white and black. I don't know why. And so I thought, right, well, I'll break for St Kilda now and that guy's my man. 
And then I started watching a bit of him and he was at the peak of his career and he was taking screamer after screamer, you know, flying like a superhero, mm. number, number one on his back. And, um, you know, the commentators would scream out his surname with delight as he sat on another bloke's shoulders. And, um, yeah, he captured my imagination. And then I got dad to take us to a, a real game at Moorabbin and couldn't believe the, just the mayhem in the, because it was standing room, would have been 90% standing room in those days. And so, um, the women, the language that women used you know, <laughs> toward the umpire, toward other crowd members, aside from the men, I was just standing there fascinated. Like I had my back to the game half the time, just looking at these people behaving in this way. I didn't know was possible. I didn't <laughs> know it was allowed, you know, um, I don't, uh, it was amazing to me. You would like, never have seen, you would never have witnessed behavior like that growing up in Glen Waverley. Sure. No, no. no. Glen Waverley is like happy days of the wonder years. It's like, <laughs> it's utopia. It's all sort of, you know, all the families in the neighborhood know each other and, they're friends and you haven't tea at each other's houses. And, you know, it was amazing. It was a very lucky background that I had as a boy, but uh, I quickly, well, it quickly became apparent that I was shit house at footy <laughs> to everybody, but me. And so if I had two kicks in a game, I could, I was. Oh, you're frozen. Wait, you fr- oh, oh no, that's better. Yeah. So um, if I was lucky, I'd get maybe like a McDonald's free fries voucher you know, as an encouragement award every eighth game. I think purely they were just wanting me to keep turning up for the numbers. I was going to say, is that just a rotational award thing? Probably, yeah. You encourage you and, yeah. Probably, but in hindsight, you thought that it was because you'd done well that day. Um, but anyway, then, as you would know, there's men and women now of way too late an age still playing in country and suburban football competitions that are no good and, you know, <laughs> they haven't been discovered yet. And if they, if they haven't been discovered no, if they haven't been discovered yet, they're not going to be discovered. I mean by like the highest levels, the AFL realms, right? Mm. And um, and they're hoping that that bloke standing by the boundary line, you know, with a dog on a lead smoking a cigarette is secretly a Hawthorne talent scout when he's only trying to like give the wife two hours to herself, you know, so that marriage doesn't end. <laughs> you, tell yourself these li- you, tell your- you tell yourself these lies, I think, just to keep going. And none of my friends or family had the heart or the courtesy to say to me, mate, you are shit ass. Stop it. You're embarrassing everybody, especially yourself. Um, but what I realised, I was watching a real game, St Kilda Melbourne at the MCG back in the late 80s, and uh, they put the attendance up on the scoreboard and it said 36,000 people are here today. And I remember thinking, hang on, there's 18 players for each team. That's 36 players. That means there's a 1,000 of us for every one of them. Mm. And I thought, I don't know why my mind went this way, but I thought, geez, heaps of them, especially the best ones, are going to write their life stories when their careers are over. But none of us are. So I thought, what about someone telling the story of a shit house footballer that didn't make it? Surely there's a bigger market for that because there's more of us that that are that. You know, we didn't make it. We have a heart that's been broken. We don't know what to do with our life now that the first dream was denied. And so then I wrote a book about it. And luckily for me, heaps of people responded and related to that. Men, women, and not just footy, not just footy. I had one woman said that she was into dressage. And she'd been trying to get into the Olympics, you know, with her horse and had to come to the same conclusion that she was shit house at dressage. <laughs> uh, some other woman said she wanted to be a ballerina, you know, and at some point or other, she realized it wasn't going to happen. So all these people hit these brick walls in their lives, or the majority of us do, you know, because what is it? Probably less than 1% makes up the people at the Olympics, for example, mm. people in the AFL or the people in the world cricket teams. Um, the rest of us just have to accept defeat and go, what's next? Yeah. And what a beautiful plot for a story. It really is. Like, I I remember when, I remember seeing you on Facebook when it first came out and I thought, oh, another football book. Okay, whatever. Then, the, And I'm not a huge reader anyway. I'll admit it. I'd like to think I am, but unless I'm reading council notes or whatever, I'm not reading much. <laughs> but then when the podcast came out and I think it was the trailer or it might have been episode one or two when you said it. It's it's gone back to, gone back to the gone back to print, and there's a new edition coming out. I thought, right. oh, bugger it. Okay, fine. I'll order it now. Well, I'll support you. Matthew in his endeavours, and I'll order thank it you. now and I'll read it. And it's a brilliant, a brilliant plot for well, a story. Thank you. So well done. Well, thank, thank you for the plot, but the plot is also just all of our lives because yeah. because I, I then in order to write the book, I got like a fool's cap bit of paper. Uh, one of those pre, pre-lined pre books that you'd have at school, you know, A4. Mm-hmm. And um, on the left-hand margin that was already, you know, because you've got the vertical lines already printed on the page and then they print the one left-hand margin. 
Yeah. Um, down the left-hand margin, I thought, right, I'll write this between when I was nine, when I first started playing footy, and when I was 29, when I realised, you know, obviously, more than 10 years too late, hey, <laughs> I'm never going to play for the Saints, right? And so then I ruled a whole lot of other vertical uh, ruler width lines down the page. And um, so I had all these little, like a graph. And um, on the left-hand column, I wrote, you know, I was nine in the top line and then 10 and then 11. So a line for each year for the 20 years between nine and 29. And then I started thinking about all the first. So your first kiss, your first bike, your first part-time job, your first fight, um, your first uh, car, your first beer, your first sex, your first job. And luckily for me and for the readers of the book, all of those were absolute disasters. <laughs> 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 I stuffed up every possible way in every opportunity of my entire life. And then, then I started writing down all the sort of like major moments of the St Kilda football club's trajectory. Mm. I couldn't believe how closely the rare St Kilda successes mirrored my rare successes. Yeah. And the majority of failures mirrored my majority of failures. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'd done like 10 years of stand-up comedy in the UK before then. And you, know, you quickly realised no one wants to hear about a good relationship no one really wants to hear about the happy things that you've done the positives you've achieved they just want to hear that you fucked up <laughs> that you stuffed up and um how exactly tell us how you stuffed up and then they relate it and feel better about when they stuffed up similarly exactly and lucky for you you're you're a stand-up comic anyway so what great material yes but at least you can laugh at yourself and all yes. of the monumental ways you have stuffed up yeah, exactly. Like I couldn't have planned it any better. No, you, know? you really couldn't. And there's That's luckily, great. thanks, I don't know, but there's luckily been um, not a lot of, you know, serious hurt or damage or hardship involved. It's just minor blows to the ego, you know, but in large numbers that accumulate. <laughs> <laughs> minor blows to the ego, which sometimes have you living in Robinvale for a few months. Well, yeah, as I say, because I was slightly going off the rails and the old man um, said to me, you know, because he was still a cop, said to my brother who'd become a cop, um, can you get him up there away from the the city life because it's you know not agreeing with him, and it sorted you out. Now you are a uh, one-eyed St Kilda supporter, and you're all about Trevor Barker. But were you a fan of Carl Dietrich? Well, no, Carl Dietrich retired. I think like the year before. So I've seen footage of him bashing everybody at every opportunity, and he was obviously a brilliant player skill-wise as well. Um, he's up from that area, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, he was my year 10, year 10, 11 English teacher, I think. Was he? Was he as scary yeah. off the field as he appeared to be on it? Yeah, he hated me too. Hated me with a passion. <laughs> he sometimes wouldn't, oh, I don't know, because I used to talk too much. He right. told me once that I'd amount to nothing if I couldn't find a job where I could talk for a living. So I went into radio. Yeah, right. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Dinner. Um, but, yeah, just hated me. Uh, sometimes I couldn't even, you know you, how you line up at the front of the classrooms before you go in? Yeah. sometimes he'd just look at me depending on what mood he was in and what smart ass thing I'd set out in the line or thrown him a look he'd go not today for Cara out <laughs> I haven't said anything yet well I'm not giving you the chance out oh okay and that happened on a regular basis so oh. but no he's a good bloke and he's um I don't know whether he's still around I know they sold up but anyway so so he is still around and uh there's another St Kilda connection I wanted to talk to you about so you started playing in under nines in a local footy league well, no, I say under nines. I was nine and I was playing for the under 13s because I think that was the lowest age group that you could play for in the area. Yeah. So I suppose that explains how I was initially no good because I was like four years too young. <laughs> I was going to say, because it would have been before Auskick. Well before. Yeah, it was way, I mean, no, it was way. They used to have what they called footy clinics, but they were just organised kind of ad hoc by random dads that were available and willing to turn up on a Saturday morning at the local primary school. So it kind of was Auskick, but I don't think it was officially arranged. Mm. Um, and what it was was like a feeder for the, what was then the Big M Little League. So, um, yeah, the Big M Little League would pick their schools because uh, back then you'd represent your school, you know, and our zone was Richmond. So yeah. each, each week, and it wasn't, it wasn't like today where sensibly you've got like eight different games going on with eight different sort of oval spaces they created half time. Back then there was one game Mm. using the whole field the same size as the players used. And so, you know, you'd be like 10 years old trying to run or play on the full-sized MCG. So what usually happened is those little league games 
mainly we were just focused in one forward pocket of one end of the game for yeah. the whole time. And if you were stuck at the other end, like I was, you didn't even see the ball, let alone touch it. So, I mean, you weren't, it's not being set up for success right from the get go. But by the time you got to 29, who were you playing for then? No one. I was living in London at the time. I was in my ninth year of doing stand up comedy across England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. That's right. You had, um, you had an encounter with the late Sean Locke. Well, yeah, I, I wrote about that on Facebook, but I've worked with him on a regular basis because him, Graham Norton, Ross Noble, um, all the famous ones. And at the time I was the headline act and they were just coming up through the ranks. I don't know what became of those people, but you know, <laughs> me, I'm back in Glen Waverley. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, um, no. So I was going quite good for quite some time. And um, then my dad looked like he was going to die mm. just as I was career peaking. How selfish of him. And so I came back home and it took him six to eight months to not die, like to get, to get out of the woods, by which point the, nightly gigs for the next two years that had already been booked in that's how uh, uh in demand live comedy was from the punters in england i mm. was booked for two two years solid every night of the week all over the uk um but that had kind of dissipated because they'd said to me well you've been back for six months we need to start we've replaced you for six months can you guarantee when you're going to come back and i went well no because my dad's only just got out of the real trouble zone it's going to probably take him another six to 12 months to get fully on his feet and back to normal. Mm. And so that's what happened. In the meantime, I started sort of piecing together a sort of new career here and ended up being on the Spicks and Specs and the Roves and the Good News Weeks and a bit of radio, a bit of comedy festival solo shows. Just started from scratch, really. And but, you know, I'd st- Sorry, I'd stopped playing footy when I was 21, 22 for Oakley Districts in the then... Southeast Suburban League, now called the Southern League. That's right. Oakley Districts. That's where I was getting to. So, yeah, so they, 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 Warwick Kappa came from Oakley Districts and uh, David Reese jones came from Oakley Districts and me, you know. <laughs> In the same sentence. What? Yeah. Those guys were always, those guys were always talking about me, I hear. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Who else are they going to yeah. talk about? Obviously not. Warwick Kappa hates talking about himself. Um, yeah. But playing local footy, in your youth, how important was it to the whole social fabric of growing up in Glen Waverley and play, you know, I, what I would you have done? Had, I, yeah, well, uh, I know it's big in country towns more than anywhere else is that's where you go on a Thursday night after work to have a drink. Uh, that's where you go after the Saturday game to have a drink. There's raffles that you're contributing to, you know, not just to keep the, the club afloat, but sometimes, you know, the whole town, it's like the meeting point. And it was for me when I was a young bloke. And, they, and after training, you'd go to the local pub together once you'd already drank at the club together. Um, somehow you try and meet girls. Some One of your teammates' sisters would, you know, every the, the fabric of my entire life was based around footy. So I suppose that's one of the reasons why I kept on playing, even though I wasn't much good at it. And I think that's why when you were talking about the the old blokes that are still playing well into their, you know, 30s and 40s, that's probably why they're still playing, especially in country towns, because a town well, like Robin what else are you, Yeah, what else are you going to do? Exactly. What else are you going to do? I want to run you through a letter. Um, as we briefly discussed, I'm also a counsellor now. Yeah. <laughs> Voted least likely to ever do anything meaningful with her life. But I am a counsellor now and I we've written a letter recently. I'm not going to read, re, actually I might, it's a pretty quick letter. But this was one that we wrote to Premier Andrews. And I know you wrote on Facebook the other day, which not many of my friends probably would, that you reckon old Dan is doing okay. I'll let you have that opinion. We won't get too political. Let me just read. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously committed to that opinion because I'm in the midst of the worst lockdown, the longest lockdown officially on earth. Mm. I still sort of think he's doing the the right thing. I'm not saying I love him, but anyway, go on. Mm. Right. So here's my letter. Premier, the social fabric of regional Victoria is being torn apart by disproportionate lockdowns and border closures. And after seven state lockdowns and yet more border restrictions in place, our communities are hurting. Not allowing community sport or spectators at community sport, some of which is the only weekly social outing for a lot of people in small communities, is having monumental economic and mental health consequences in our communities. The confusion around the rules is also having adverse effects by allowing 300 people together in an indoor venue of 1,200 square metres, but not allowing people to gather mostly in their cars 
to sit and honk the horn. That's not in the letter. And in the vast open space, like a country football oval or netball court, is playing with the psyche of country Victorians and those who we consider part of Victoria, but who live on the other side of the river. Clubs are struggling, people are suffering, and communities are dying without their sport and clubs to be part of. This is ripping the heart out of regional Victoria, and we're asking you to consider an alternative approach when placing restrictions on our regional communities who have little and in some cases no COVID-19 infection. I agree with every word. Great. I don't live where you live, but I agree with every word. Um, It obviously can't continue the way that it is. Um, I suppose what we're all scared to do is, you know, do the old letter rip theory, which is the only apparent option, and hope that we're not the ones that die. Um, Yeah. And I, and I don't I don't know much about politics, but I can't see why it would benefit Dan Andrews or any leader, whether it's Jacinda Ardern, who's tightened everything up in New Zealand. I don't see how it's benefiting them from locking us all up because they're obviously under the same regime themselves or their kids are. And a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, but, you know, they don't obey the same rules as if as if a Dan Andrews or a, or a Jacinda or any leader could get away with their kids like if they got caught doing stuff yeah. that we're not doing, yeah. they'd be finished. Anyway, so, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. It can't continue and it is obviously killing off small towns, small businesses, big businesses, uh, melting people's minds because we're not used to this oppression. Mm. Um, and that's that's the bit that that I think, because we've had, we managed to play most of the season. We had yeah. a couple of little interruptions with the snap lockdowns and whatever through the season. But right when we got to the end, that was it. No more, well, like with this last lockdown, no finals. We didn't even get to start finals. We didn't get to have the last round, no finals. And it's really from a, you know, someone who loves footy to have that ripped away from you. And I think that's why people at the moment, at least for some part of it, as well as all the economic and the political aspects and all the rest of it and the vaccination and all the rest of the hoo-ha that I'm not going to talk about. But they're not having sport or not having their local sport and their footy, and we'll get to what you think of the AFL in recent times shortly, but I think that's really playing with people's minds, like just having it stopped. Usually you get to wind down, you know, you get the final series and then it's all over and you get Mad Monday. With none of that. No. And this is the sort of social fabric that these kids that have, you know, we had four or five teams that were at the top of the ladder and they've just had it ripped away from them. So, Well, on one hand, all the teams I played played for were so hopeless. We would have welcomed a lockdown. We (laughs) would have been happy to have the season end before it was supposed to have an excuse uh, to avoid getting thrashed another six times before the year came to a close. But in the current circumstances, you know, I don't know what else to do. I haven't think. I think the letting it rip thing isn't the answer, but I don't think being locked down to this extent is the answer either, but no one seems to be putting up a good in-betweener idea that makes sense to myself, at least so far. No, well, up this end of the state, my own little solution, and this is, this is my, actually, no, this is a council position, having things opened up by LGA. So Shepparton, and yeah, okay, there's a bit of an issue in Ballarat now as far as regional goes, but in rural Victoria, have the LGAs open up might be a bit of a solution. But anyway, we won't get into politics because we're here to have a bit of a laugh and a chuckle. And what is I don't even know what an LGA is. A local government area, Matthew. How old are you? 50. <laughs> You've got this far without knowing. What council are you a part of? Me? Yeah. Waverley, Monash? You Monash don't know. Council. Oh, Monash Council. Well, that's your yeah. LGA. So yeah, LGA. So where Swan Hill is our LGA. Next door is Mildura across the river. Anyway, let me to ask hey, you about what? This is being educational. I appreciate oh, it. Good. Well, you've learned something today. A day is yeah. not wasted if you've learned a lesson. Right. Let me ask you another question. I'd like to point out that I'm in my daughter's bedroom, which is where the <laughs> Wi-Fi is best too. Oh, pink, right. uh, pink, pink pineapple curves. Although... I did try and I've stuck a Dennis Lilly and a David Hooks poster and a St Kilda mirror in the background <laughs> to try and because I'm bringing them up right. Okay. Anyway. Right. Okay. Go on. Sure. Um, question. <laughs> question is the most recent era of football. Now I'm a Richmond supporter, so I've had yeah. very little interest in the AFL this year because. Oh, boo hoo! You yeah, didn't win premiership for once. Yeah, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. But I just feel like. 
it's lost a bit of its luster. I don't know whether it's the recent rule changes or what's going on, but I feel like it's glorified netball at the moment. Well, I kind of agree, but um, I love footy so much that I personally find myself just uh, turning a blind eye and ignoring uh, all of the things that would otherwise infuriate me. And a lot of my mates of my age are saying, I'm finished. It's not what it once was. But for me, I can't not have footy in my life. Um, I went that decade over in the UK without it. And it's almost like it's so weird to live in a country that doesn't even know really that Aussie rules exists. Mm. Right? So it's not, it went from being about 80% of my everyday conversation to zero. And um, how dare they make me broaden my areas of interest? You know, because <laughs> footy was cut off immediately upon arrival. And to me, it was as weird as if I was saying to another culture, oh, yeah, so, um, so I'm reading this book, right? And someone would go, book? What is a book? Right? <laughs> or I saw this movie, right? Movie? What is a movie? So if I was going to go, oh, my team in the AFL is doing really, what team? What is the AFL? It's like, what? How do you not even know it exists? I'm offended. Mm. But I can't, like, you know, I was the odd one out, not the other way around. So I just had to shut up and find other interests. But, yeah, so I, I've missed that decade. I feel like I'm always trying to make up for it. And also, if I stop watching footy, then what am I going to do with myself, you know? I love footy, so I'm just going to have to love it. I suppose it's almost like being in a relationship. The person gets more and more annoying. You think, <laughs> well, I've been here for so long, I don't want to take the risk about doing something totally different or seeing someone otherwise. I'll just put up with the increasing infuriation that they're causing me. And also, <laughs> and also I've been here for the long haul. You can kill to win a premiership and I've stopped barracking for them. That will render the previous 40 years redundant. <laughs> That's the, that's possibly the best analogy I've heard with regard oh. to recent football that I've heard in the last, at least the last, probably ever. Right. Probably ever. Did you, when you were in the UK, did you get into soccer or football? Well, a little bit, but I was scared to pick a team because I thought that I would curse them to be as bad as St Kilda always have been. Mm. In fact, I would have barracked for um, Southampton, who are the Saints. So that would have been a, a, sensical, a sensible transaction. But they were always hopeless at the time that I was there as well. So mainly... I followed individual players. So I didn't follow a team because I just knew I would curse that team to being at the bottom of the table forever. Did you curse the individual players that you no, were? No, 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 no. David Beckham's career did not suffer from me following it closely. <laughs> because David Beckham's career hung solely on your opinion of him. Yeah. Hmm, obviously. He, he still doesn't return my calls or thank me. <laughs> How rude. Yeah. How very rude. So you haven't got into, you wouldn't like dabble in, do you, do you get into cricket? Yeah, I love cricket. Yeah, okay. Because when I was a kid, there was <laughs> footy in the winter and cricket in the summer. And I ended up playing cricket because I was bored. I didn't know what to do when there was no footy to play or to go to. And and I was pissed off that I was good at cricket straight away. <laughs> I was really good at cricket and I didn't want to be. And I was really <laughs> bad at footy and I wanted to be good at it. So it was like a reversal. That's why I don't believe in God. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the wrong gifts. <laughs> oh, gosh. Because you are you a batsman in crit cricket? No, I was really a tall. tall, angry, young, fast bowler. Yeah, right. Okay. One, winning, who, a whole, winning a whole bunch of trophies and doing really well and thinking, shit, I'd swap this for half of these skills as a footy player, but that's not how it works, right? <laughs> no, that's not how it works. But wasn't footy created... Aussie rules football, wasn't it created specifically to keep the cricket players occupied. Fit during the yeah, occupied and fit during the winter? I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, so that's what I was doing. Like you say, I was <laughs> playing for the same cricket club that I played footy for. Oh, really? Yeah, because you're just hanging around with the same people and it's already organized. You just turn up on time and you get a game, especially if you're okay at it, like I was. Yeah, right. And they were slightly short on numbers. And so I, I was full. I had one good year in 1991 when I was full back for the twos for Oakley Districts. And, um, and I, was really, I was really, really good. All the planets aligned. But it was a brief, it was a brief moment of pleasure. I'm sorry. I got stuck on full back for the twos. Yeah, and hey, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> I mean, no, good. Good for you. I mean, I, that's great. I was getting the game. I was a grown man as opposed to being a little kid. <laughs> I hadn't played for about five years. I was really skinny and the other blokes were really big. And so I'd have to cheat as well, hold their jumper when they went to lead. And they'd say one more time and I'll punch you in the face. I'd go, we're well, going to have to, because that's all I've got. I just, <laughs> but I considered that to be good. And of course, when you fall back, every time they kick a point, you get a kick because you've got to kick it out. And um, 
every time you cheat by holding the leading full forwards jumper, usually they then do a stuttered run at it because you've hampered their first move and you get to mark it by yourself. And then most of the blokes I played with had done time. They were like some <laughs> bad guys at Oakley Districts at the time. So all I had to do was hold my, I'd maybe take the first punch or dodge the first punch from the full forward who was unhappy I'd been cheating. And then um, if I held him close in like a jumper punch situation, I knew it was only three or four seconds before the cavalry of proper badasses came in <laughs> and smashed this bloke to the point where he was just going to let me hold his jumper for the rest of the game rather than deal with my teammates again. Uh, it's so, that, yeah. old, that old, the lippy one starts the fight and waits for somebody else to finish it. Yep, I was that asshole. That's smart though. That's smart, especially on the footy field. That's really smart. Well, I knew my limitations. So you'd at least average a couple of kicks a game then. Well, you get about 20 kicks, 10, between 10 and 20 kicks, depending on how accurate they are for goal or not. <laughs> exactly. Or, and I was, very, I was always very keen to rush the ball through for a point too because I couldn't get it in open play, but I knew if I put it through for a point, then I get the kick out. That's awesome. That's very smart. Well done. Yeah. All right, Matthew. We'll let you go. I won't take up any time, any more of your time. Saturday afternoon fever is the podcast and the book, and it's um, it's back out. You can get it on Booktopia again. Yeah, it's called yeah Saturday afternoon fever, and uh, it's now twenty two years old. Nineteen ninety nine, it got published. It was available and selling well till about two thousand and fifteen. Then it had a six year hiatus, and now this podcast, which is me reading it with Lawrence Mooney, the great Australian comedian, who was brought up in the same era in the same area as me, um. And every time I read parts of the book, he goes, oh, that reminds me of this bit about my childhood. And away we go. And luckily, one of our listeners is Jade Benham, Nee Fakara. Lucky yeah. us. And I tell you what, some of the some of the stories that have come up, whether it's by you or Lawrence Mooney or whoever, whoever brings up the stories, I've always got one that I can – and I think that's why it's so popular. And I think that's why the book's right. so popular. Because right. when you describe the taking out of the chewing gum out of the footy cards pack – yeah. Everyone know everyone of our generation knows what you're talking about because I don't oh, even little, come with chewing yeah. gum anymore. No, well, I used to have the stick of pink chewy and then the sprinkle of white caster sugar on top of it. Exactly, that you'd have to blow off the top card. Yeah. 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 Then shine the first card on your sleeves, give it a yeah. shake. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember though because I ended up listening, I listen to all my podcasts when I'm in the car because it's a good hour and a half between here and Swan Hill. So I listen to them all in the car and I lose track of episodes bad memory but last week I remember and this is when I messaged you and went oh my god in one episode I've ended up literally ugly crying in the car listening to you talk about your dear mum watching the St Kilda Grand Final was that 11 2011 Uh, no that was no that wasn't a grand final that was recent that was uh last last September when St Kilda got into the finals for the first time for quite a few years and won our first final against Footscray Right. Yeah, so it was only last November that Mum went into care. Yep. And last September, where St Kilda last played in a final, which we won. And then we played mm. in another one, which we lost. But, yeah, that uh, that night, because Mum, I think as I described in the podcast, Mum's, like, radio reception has been sort of wavering in and out. And um, But that night, the reception was fine-tuned. She was, all of her, all of her thoughts were together and she was switched on and... Uh, and I sort of had a feeling that this might be one of the last hurrahs because we knew that she was going to have to sort of not be able to live by herself for much longer. And uh, and I sent that photo with me and my mum cheering and video of my mum and I singing the Saints theme song together. And it did turn out to be that way, unfortunately. But she's quite happy in the aged care joint. She's joining in on all the activities and, you know, she's doing okay. But, yeah, that was kind of like the final moment of our family in the old home together at the same oh, time gosh so that story even now i'm i'm holding it together but only barely so that well, had the ugly crying but then in the next episode <laughs> well i'm not going to talk about that if you want to you can i'm still a bit I embarrassed am going to talk about, i am going to talk about you shouldn't be embarrassed but you're listening to the moon man talk about <laughs> having an explosive wet dream on a bus to dubbo I know. I <laughs> because, ugly crying, pissing uh, myself uh, laughing. Great. Because in his youth, a girl that he'd been seeing for a while broke up with him and moved to the country. And he decided uh, to Dubbo, which is, you know, deep New South Wales. And he was suburban Melbourne. He decided to get like three or four busters over three or four days or nights or however long it takes when you've got the cheapest ticket you can afford to go to Dubbo to convince her to come back to Melbourne. 
he mm-hmm. failed in his attempt. But yeah, as the bus was pulling into Dubbo, he was asleep and he'd had himself a wet, wet dream in his in his tracky dacks. And next minute he hears the air brakes go and the bus driver say, we've arrived. And he's got his <laughs> ex-girlfriend waiting for him down the steps by the door. And he's made a mess of himself. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's a bit embarrassing. The, the I don't know. I find myself occasionally prudish. But if you like it, yeah, then I love it. I was going to say, you were quite prudish. That's not that's not my memories of you, Matthew Hardy. Well, no, it, the weird, he was using the word, um, I'm going to spell it. He was, he was using the word B-L-O-W to describe <laughs> the, the song. <laughs> describe the, uh, the uh, main end point of the wet dream and i hadn't heard that word used in that context since like i don't know year 10 he also i feel myself, almost, blush- I feel myself almost blushing talking to a lady about that topic now lady and obviously we both got we Where? both got kids it's not, it's not like we don't <laughs> it's not like we don't understand what a wet dream is no well exactly exactly but it is just the phrase just the phrase wet dream i think is like gone now isn't it who's well, that nowadays exactly and i was kind of befuddled when he was talking about he was like in his early 20s having a wet dream like on a bus in his track yeah, exactly yeah. that's but so he, said he was worried about what well, he worried about whether the other passengers were like accidentally witnessing the orgasmic noises he must have been making <laughs> 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 it is very funny. And you know what? It got me thinking about my, not that, not that whole oh, scenario. Oh, that wet dreams <laughs> that you've had on buses. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the plethora of buses I've actually caught in my life. Yeah. No, no, no. The podcast got me thinking about footy cards that I used to collect in in my sort of youth. You've got a Fitzroy one, haven't you? I've got a Fitzroy one from when Dougie Hawkins defected and went to Fitzroy for those couple of years. It's and weird, I, isn't it? Because you think... You think about when Nicky Winmar played a year with Footscray, uh, Dougie Hawkins played a year with Fitzroy. You almost need to erase that from our collective memories because it doesn't suit the full story as as we want it to be. Exactly. But this footy card, because you took incredible care of your footy cards, this yeah. one is still in its plastic cover and still in perfect condition. Wow. You might mm. better buy another house with that. No, I don't think. If it was a if it was a Footscray <laughs> one, then maybe, but not the Fitzroy Perhaps. one, I don't think. Well, that might make it more rare. Well, maybe. It it, yeah, it might be like a Michael Jordan baseball card as opposed to ba- basketball. That one year he had a breakdown and played another sport instead. That's right. Yeah, I think yeah. we've all erased that from our memory too, haven't we? Yeah. He did yeah. play basketball, baseball. Doesn't he still own a baseball team? He owns everything he wants to, doesn't he? Yeah, well, half his luck too. He's not, like David Beckham, he's not returning my call, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for returning my call. Thank you for returning my messages. Everyone should listen to it. It's Saturday Afternoon Fever. Grab the book. It's an easy read. It's um, it's a, it's a journey. It's an emotional journey, but it's well worth it. You will find yourself kissing yourself laughing. Matthew Hardy, thank you very much for joining us. And That's come back to Robin Vale anytime you get a chance when we're allowed out of lockdown. Come to a local footy game. Actually, you know what? I'll put you on the spot right now. Next season when we're allowed to, maybe you should come and play a game at fullback for the Rezies. No, thanks. I'm 50 years old and I like okay. my I like my Achilles intact, if that's okay. Fine. Well, maybe we'll have a comedy night then. You can headline that. You could do that or I could drink a whole lot of cans and contribute to the, you know, the bar take. Okay, well, that that too. I mean, we're happy for anything. Sold. Love vis- visitors. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Talk to you later. Thanks, legend.